Over all the earth you reign on high, every mountain stream, every sunset sky, but my one request, Lord, my only name, is that you reign in me again. Awesome to be here uh, tonight. Phillips out. Laura got COVID, so obviously he's a close contact of that. And some of our uh, older guys are out today for who knows why, but that leaves you with the uh, bottom of the bucket, Trent Thomas. So, uh, <laughs> guys, let's get into the slides. Uh, we got a lot of stuff coming up. Uh, we had a awesome Serves Day event, and uh, we want to get CC to talk kind of about what happened. There's a slide. There's a slide for the. If you'll go to like the tadpole slide. Yeah. Okay. So on Tuesday we went. Um, like group of probably like nine or ten of us. We went on a tadpole rescue mission. So there's this lady um, who lives in the community and she is disabled and basically um, she just has this pool that was full of tadpoles. You can see the pool um, in that bottom left picture of us. But um, it was just full of tadpoles and frogs. And so basically, um, we just went out there and we took some nets and we rescued some tadpoles. Like, that was her one wish with the pool, was just that we would take these tadpoles and we would go drop them off somewhere where they could live um, happily. So we filled up like two buckets. Like, you can't really tell as much. All those on the in that bucket, like, the side are like full grown frogs and then all the dark down at the bottom is just tons of tadpoles. It was insane. Um, and then at the end, we went and we dropped them off the creek by the church. So there's probably going to be like thousands of frogs coming soon um, at the creek by the church. And um, then also at the end, we were, um, we prayed, um, Emerson led a prayer for the lady and her family. And then one of the coolest things was after um, he led that prayer, then they, um, her husband, he, um, he prayed for us. So it was really cool because we prayed for them and then they prayed for us. So it was just a really cool little thing. And she posted about it on Facebook and she actually wants us to go rescue some more of them because we didn't get all of them. So just keep being on the lookout for another tadpole rescue. Man. Awesome. Thank you. CC in that group who went. That's crazy stuff. Uh, we've got Summer Youth Series uh, this Thursday um, and it's actually at Mount Juliet. So I uh, hope you all will uh, come out to that. I know it'll be an awesome event, and uh, just bring your uh, smiling faces as we uh, greet some guests to come to us. Uh, we've got a tag event, um, which is Tell About God, and that's going uh, to be going on every day, um, Tuesday, Thursday, uh, right at 1 o'clock. So I hope you'll be there for that. We've got Goodwill Hunting coming up, which is uh, normally something that is an awesome event that we don't normally do. Uh, during the summer, we normally do it during the school year, but um, we didn't have a time slot for it or something. So we're bringing it this, uh, this Tuesday uh, on the 5th, so that's a ton of fun. I hope you all, uh, anyone that can be there, uh, will do that. It's a ton of fun. Uh, we got the Sneedville mission trip. That's why uh, we got a large group of uh, people that aren't here tonight. They're doing just, you can see what they're doing, a ton of good work in Sneedville. Uh, led by the Lonnieses and just good work that's going over there. So keep them in your prayers as you will. Uh, if you want to uh, look at any of the information or any events coming up uh, for our youth group the rest of the summer, there's the uh, Encyclopedia Yeti. So go ahead and scan there if you want any of that information. Um, and then we've got um, our Mad Props that we've been uh, going through on our Wednesday night series. Tonight we're hearing from a familiar face, Austin Oakley. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah, we've got um, Teen VBS coming up next week, um, and tonight we're actually going to have the opportunity um, to vote for what theme you want. So I'm going to turn it over to, I guess, CC to talk about your uh, options you have tonight. Okay, so um, we're going to vote. I have 
a link. I'll send it out. Um, how about I send it out after we get done with class tonight, and you guys vote on it, and then next Wednesday night we'll tell you what it is. I think Team BBS maybe is two weeks away or three. Um, and Rachel is right now, we have two options. We did like a pitch meeting, and Rachel has two options, and she's going to read you kind of like a blurb for each of them. And then also the blurb is going to be on the form I send out, so you can reread it. But Rachel's just going to give you like a sneak peek of what um, the themes could be. is imagine going to the movies with three of your friends. After the movie's over, someone asks the four of y'all to tell about the movie. Each one of you describe it differently. You mention different scenes that stuck out to you. You talk about different characters, and your personality would come out in the way you told the story. In a similar way, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all tell the story of Jesus, but each one of them has their own unique way of saying it. Um, the series would focus on the incredible story um, the four of them had to tell, and what makes their perspective so special. So it's like a study of all the Gospels. Um, and then option number two is, um, we talk a lot about the Father and the Son, but sometimes the Holy Spirit gets treated like an uncle we aren't sure what to do with. This series seeks to change that. The spirit of this study, or this series, um, is to gain a better understanding of the Spirit. Um, the role he plays, the way he works, and what it means to live a Spirit-infused life. So there's your two options. One of them's like the gospel, the second one's the Holy Spirit. So you can vote. Thank you. Yes. Thank you and I'll send it out to remind. Uh, I'll send it to the parents too. So if you don't have a phone, then your parent will get the um, doc for you to vote. Yes. All right. Tonight we got, uh, like I said, we got Austin Oakley speaking. Um, is that our last slide? I think we got. Okay. Yeah, we've got. Um, uh, Philip made a little video just introducing Austin, so uh, we'll play that, and then we'll uh, have Austin come up and uh, bring us the word. What's up, youth group? Good to see you guys virtually. I uh, wish that I could be there in person. I miss y'all, and I look forward to seeing you soon. wanted to take just a minute to introduce you to Austin Oakley. A lot of you guys know who he is. Some of you may remember him from when he was here before, but it's also been a little while. But Austin uh, was one of our youth ministers in residence. Uh, in fact, he was the second one to wear that title after Jody Marble left. He was the one who came in to replace him. Uh, I met Austin when he was a freshman at Freed Hardeman. He was a really impressive young man who happened to make a trip to Mount Juliet with the youth ministry class there. Uh, they used to come and observe our youth ministry program and kind of ask questions about how we did things and Austin was one of those really impressive students in that class. Uh, he always stuck out to me. Uh, he impressed me so much in that little meeting that when it came time for us to look for some summer interns, uh, Austin was a guy that I reached out to and um, I guess the rest is sort of history from there. He came and did two summers with us as a summer intern and then uh, later on when it was time to hire a youth minister in residence. He was just a natural choice for us. Uh, he is a really great guy. He did great ministry for us here. We're indebted to him for the way that he served during his time at Mount Juliet. Even though he cut out on us a little bit short, um, no hard feelings at all. I'm so proud of him. And I love the fact that he's continued to find ways to serve God, find ways to serve God doing youth ministry, actually. Uh, even though he left Mount Juliet a little bit earlier than we wanted him to, He's doing great things for God, and I love that he continues to serve him in the way of youth ministry. Austin, we're so proud of you. Thank you for being here with us tonight. I'm sorry I can't be there in person, but know that I'm watching uh, from home, and I look forward to your message. Let's have a prayer for Austin, and then I'll turn things over to him. Father in heaven, thank you so much for the servant that you've created in Austin. I'm thankful that uh, he was able to serve us and serve so many students here uh, and continues to serve you in great ways uh, in the Florence area. We're grateful for his family. We pray that you'd be with them and keep them all safe. Um, bless his message tonight and help us all to grow. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, hello, family. It's very good to be here. Sorry I came in like the second peak of COVID. I sound all stopped up. I promise I don't have COVID. Um, but it's super, super 
humbling and excited to be here. Um, this place will change you. I hope you all know that. Um, Bailey and I think often of our times here, and it's all positive stuff. We love the church here, love the people here. Um, we weren't here when a lot, of, a lot of you were here, but I know some of your older siblings, so it's just a really cool place. So when I walk in my office every morning, I see this little, little guy right here. Y'all have one? Anybody have one? So what is this, obviously? It's a Yeti. So when you see this and you think about, well, I don't know what you think about. When you see this, what, what comes to your mind? Any thoughts come to your mind when you see this little Yeti? Maybe church camp? Maybe uh, pray and play, suck up the sun, whatever it is. You think of your times here um, with the youth group, obviously. So when I walk in my office every day and I see this little Yeti, Mount Juliet is literally home for me and Bailey. Um, I started here right when I graduated Freed. We got married like the week after, and so it was our first home. And so when I see this every morning, it reminds me of home. And so what I want us to do tonight is I want us to think about this idea of home. And so all of us have different homes. Obviously, they look different. Our parents are different. Um, we come from different backgrounds. We live in different cities. We just All of our homes look different. And so when I was thinking about the concept of coming back home tonight, I was like, who's going to be there? What's it going to be like? It's going to look different. You know, what's this going to be like? So I can remember when I was closer to y'all's age, because I'm getting old now. Um, have you ever maybe done something at school or before you went to school, you had an argument with your parent and you kind of dreaded going home? Anybody ever been there? I think we all have. Why? Because we're afraid of what's going to happen when we come home, right? So as Christians, I think we have this mentality, obviously God is our Father, and so when we fail Him and we fall away, or maybe we have not been baptized and we're not a Christian yet, we think about this concept like, where is God or what is it going to be like when I come home? And so the question I want us to explore tonight is this idea of, is where is God when I want to come home? The answer is very simple, and we'll get there in just a second. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Luke chapter 15, we'll get there in just a second. We're not going to spend much time there, but we do want to answer this question from there. So the answer to this question is very, very simple. However, living it out, believing it, and understanding it is a little bit more tricky, and that's what I want us to spend the majority of our time with uh, looking at tonight. So where is God when I want to come home? I want us to start in Luke chapter 15. So a pretty familiar passage for a lot of us in here. We're not going to read it, but I do want to highlight a few, a few aspects. So it's the parable of the prodigal son. You've got two sons. You've got the younger son who basically says to his father, Father, I want my inheritance before you die. And so he gives it to him and he goes off and he spends it very wisely, right? No, he goes off and he, he wasted. Um, and so in verse 17, he found himself eating the pig food. And in verse 17, it says, the Bible says, And when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. Verse 20, and, and he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion, and he ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Verse 22, but the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He is lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Notice verse 25. Now his older son was in the field and as he came and drew near to where? I heard it. The house. Verse 25, so now, now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing and singing. Where was the father when the prodigal son wanted to come home? He was waiting for him. He was waiting for him. And obviously this is a parable, so it's an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. So when we take that and look at it in our context, when we want to come home to God for the first time or the 5,000th time, where is he? He's waiting for us. So that's the easy answer. Uh, the Bible's pretty clear, pretty, pretty straightforward and, and factual that God is waiting for us when we want to come home. But why is that so hard to understand and so hard to kind of believe? And I think it boils down to this idea of expectations versus wants. 
um, wants versus expectations. So let's give a few examples here. Uh, let's say boyfriend, girlfriend relationship. Boyfriend expects girlfriend to do certain things. Girlfriend expects boyfriend to do certain things. They don't live up to those expectations. What happens to the relationship? It fails. That's exactly the word I was looking for. Thank you. It fails. <clears throat> all right, so let's think about school. Let's say your parents expect you to make all A's. Any of y'all in here? No, I'm just going to argue. Your parents expect you to make all A's. You come home with three B's. What did you do in the eyes of your parents? You failed. Uh, let's think about basketball. We'll do basketball. So let's say that your coach expects you to score 20 points a game and you average 15. What did you do in the eyes of your coach? You failed. Last one, music. Let's say you have a piano ensemble or something like that and your music teacher expects you to hit 100% of your notes and you hit 98%. What did you do in the eyes of your band director? You failed. The simple truth is this, is that unmet expectations lead to failure. In an English sense, is there a difference between a want and an expectation? Absolutely. If your parents wanted you to make all A's, but you came home with two B's, were you a failure in the eyes of your parents? No, because there's a difference between a want and an expectation. So unmet expectations lead to failure. When I think about it from a Christian perspective, we want to ask this question, so, so then what does God expect of me? So if unmet expectations lead to failure, and I think all of us in here tonight don't want to be a failure in the eyes of God, so it begs the question is what does God expect of me? I think for so long, for the majority of my life, um, I had this idea that God expected me to not sin. And I had convinced myself that as long as I could not sin or if I avoided sin, then I was doing exactly what God wanted me to do. Am I saying that God does not want us to avoid sin? No. But what I'm saying is, let me give you a math example. So if I don't sin and I don't sin and I don't sin and I don't sin and I don't sin. So 0 plus 0 plus 0 plus 0 plus 0 equals what? So if we only not sin, are we really doing any good for the kingdom? We're not. And that's why God, that's why Jesus, while you're on this earth, he talks a lot about bearing fruit. Now, does God want us to avoid sin? Absolutely. But he also wants us to bear fruit. And so what does God expect to make? Because if we live a life based around the idea that God's expectation for us is to not sin, what happens when we sin? We are a failure in the eyes of God. That's what we allow Satan to convince ourselves of ourselves. If we don't live up to this expectation of being perfect or not sinning, then we're a failure. Okay, so we fail and we come back home to God. What's going what's gonna to naturally happen? We're going to sin again. So we fail again, come back, fail again, come back. We allow Satan to convince us that there comes a point where God gives up on us, right? That's Satan telling us that. That's not God telling us that. But that's what this idea of expectations kind of comes out to. So what I want us to do, I want us to look at a few verses. And if anybody wants to read, that'll be completely fine uh, because you can tell my voice is about to be gone. So let's start in Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. So I want us to look, I've got it underlined, but we're going to look at this kind of phrase of the will of God. So if we want to explore this idea of what does God expect of me, maybe another way that you've heard it is what is God's will for your life. So I can remember when I was a junior, senior in high school, people were always telling me, man, I just hope you find out what God's will for your life is. Y'all heard that phrase? Anybody confused by that phrase? Yeah, because I didn't have a clue what God wanted me to do. And it was like if you had 14 different choices in your life as far as college, as far as boyfriend, girlfriend, as far as where you're going to live, I had convinced myself that there was one correct path and that all the other ones were wrong, and it was up to me to figure out what path God wanted me on. And I think the Bible just paints a little bit different of a picture. So Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So does the Bible paint a picture that there is a will of God for our life? Yeah, let's continue. <clears throat> Next slide, please. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 18. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is what? The will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Next slide. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 15, For this is, again, the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Next. 
Colossians chapter 1 and verse 9 through 12. And so, from the day we have heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Being strengthened with all power according to His glorious might for all the endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in His light. So that's several verses, but basically what Paul is saying here um, to the Colossians is that the will of God looks like bearing fruit and doing good. So remember that, keep that thought in the back of your mind. Next slide. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 5. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. So there again, he kind of explains what the knowledge of his will is. Singing songs, making melody in your heart, encouraging one another. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3. This is where I think the Bible kind of answers it in an umbrella sense of kind of sort of. I'll, I'll explain. For this is the will of God. Could Paul be any more direct to the church of Thessalonica? He couldn't. So if we ask this question, what is God's will for my life? Then Paul is fixing to answer it. What does he say? Your sanctification. That's one of those big Bible words that we're like, what in the world does that mean? Sanctification is the process of being made holy. I don't want you to forget that. Sanctification is the process of being made holy. So in this context, that is abstain abstaining from sexual immorality. But if we were to go back and look at all the previous verses, which were not, sanctification would fall under everything that we just talked about. So doing good, bearing fruit, making the best use of your time, singing psalms and hymns to one another, uplifting one another. So God's will for my life, God's will for your life, is sanctification. Let's continue. I think this one, yeah. So go with me to 1 Peter chapter 1. This looks like a lot of verses, but they all connect. So 1 Peter chapter 1. And I want us to look at just a few verses here. So to set the context in the book of 1 Peter, chapter 1 is talking about the hope that we have through Jesus. So English-wise, hope could be defined as a want. Okay, so remember we talked about wants and expectations. So if somebody were to ask you, do you want to go to heaven? What would your answer be? Of course, yes. But would there be any expectation involved with it? Let me explain. So let's say uh, for Christmas you say, I want this present. Or at a basketball game you say, I want to win. Or somebody's sick and you go visit them in the hospital and you say, I hope you get to feeling better. Is there any expectation involved in any of those examples? There's not. We don't know that we're going to win. We don't know that we're going to get that present. And we don't know that that person's going to get, get better. And so I think we misdefine. I'm going to create that word because that's not a word. I think we misdefine the word hope biblically because it is an expectation. And so when Peter here is talking about we have a hope of heaven, he's almost saying like Jesus didn't come to earth and go through all the things that he went through so you could just want to go to heaven. He did it so that you could expect it. Not of anything that we do, of course, but only through the power of God. But that's kind of the setting. So, verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So there we go, that idea of hope. Skip down to verse 10. Concerning this what? Concerning this salvation the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours they searched and inquired carefully inquiring what person or time the spirit of christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of christ and subsequent glories it was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves but you in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the holy spirit sent from heaven here's what i want us to, to connect it things into which angels long to look what is the context of verses 10 through 12 concerning this what? Salvation. So Peter is saying that angels long to look 
at the salvation that we have. Well, that kind of begs this question, why in the world would angels long to look at the salvation that we have? Well, let's kind of take a step back. When an angel rebelled against God, what happened to him? They were cast out of heaven. When we rebel against God and turn our backs on him and run away from him, what does he allow us to do? Come right back. It's the beauty of grace. That's the picture of grace. So, angels long to look at the salvation that we have. Verse 13, therefore. When you see the word therefore in the Bible, it's always a bridge. So it's connecting what was just said to what's coming. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is what? Holy. You also be holy in all of your conduct, since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. So we ask this question, what does God expect of you, or what is God's will for your life? Biblically, it's holiness. God wants you to be holy. And so I can remember when I was a, a young buck, um, you have so many questions running through your mind, like, where do I go to school? What do I major in? All these just life-altering decisions. And it's not this simple, but it is this simple. God wants you to be holy. And so if you have four or five options in front of you, and all of them are going to allow you to live a holy life, which one does God want you to choose? Whichever you want, because His will for your life is holiness. Now, Let's just take boyfriend, girlfriend, for example. If, if you've got two or three significant other prospects, I don't even know what y'all call them these days, and, and two of them are going to allow you to live a holy life and be a good example for you, and one of them's not, then which one's automatically off the table? It's the one. God's will is not for you to be with that person because it's not going to equal living a holy life. So what does that look like? Well, if you want to go into education or whatever, God wants you to be holy. He wants you to be a Christian who does something. So whether that's education, nursing, business, whatever it is, God's will for your life is holiness in whatever you do. So let's pull it down and kind of get down to the nitty-gritty, if you will, as Nacho Libre likes to put it. So God's will for our life is to live holy. So I have two questions, and then I kind of want to leave the lesson with you. Can there be sin... In the pursuit of holiness? Yes. Will there be sin in the pursuit of holiness? Yes. Does God expect you to not sin? Oh, trick question. He wants us to not sin, but does He expect us to not sin? He doesn't, because we're not perfect. If we were perfect, who would we not need? Jesus. And so if we allow ourselves to be fooled with this idea that God expects us to be perfect and we don't live up to that, then what are we in the eyes of God? We convince ourselves we're a failure. So can there be sin in the pursuit of a holy life? Yes. Will there be sin in the pursuit of a holy life? Yes. Does that give us a free option to do whatever we want? No. First John paints a beautiful picture um, that when we are in Christ, when we abide in Christ, when we are doing the will of God, when we are trying to live a holy life, that when we do fall short, the blood of Jesus is there to constantly forgive us. And so I think I've even shared from this very spot at this very room many years ago. When I was a teenager and even in college, I had this idea that like I went from saved to unsaved. I'd fall short, I'd ask for forgiveness, fall short, ask for forgiveness. And so I had convinced myself, like, if I didn't die just in the right moment, then I was doomed. And that's just not what the, the picture of the Bible paints. Aren't we so thankful that we have a constant forgiveness of sin when we are in Christ? We don't have to be perfect, but as long as we have Jesus, we can be, per we can be perfect because He is perfect. So, does the name Kent Brantley ring a bell to anybody? Okay, cool. So Kent Brantley was an American missionary. No, everybody said no, by the way. Um, Kent Brantley was an American missionary in Africa. Long before COVID, there was an epidemic, pandemic, I get them confused, Ebola. 
Anybody, does that ring a bell to anybody? Okay, so he was in Africa doing mission work, and he contracted Ebola. How many cases were in America at this time? Zero. So where do they bring Kent Brantley to be treated? America. And so everybody's causing this uproar that he's here. They're afraid that it's going to cause outbreak in America. Anyway, so I heard him speak at Freed when I was a freshman. And obviously this was like a terrifying moment in his life. They had no idea what was going to happen. Um, they didn't have any research on it, no study on it, anything. And so when he gets better, do you know where he goes right back to? To Africa. And so somebody asked him this question like, Kent, was there ever a moment in your life where you were just terrified and didn't have a clue what God wanted you to do. And he said this, and I'll never forget it. He said, I feel like in my life, or not just I feel like, I know that in my life, the safest place to be is in the middle of God's will. The safest place to be is in the middle of God's will. And I never forgot that. And so if we use that quote tonight and we kind of put two pictures together, what is God's will for your life? Holiness. God's will for your life is holiness. And so if we look at that quote, and we kind of put it in Mount Julietti terms, for us tonight, the safest place that we can be is in the middle of holiness. Listen, there are going to be some times when you choose a holy life where you are completely by yourself. Where's the safest place to be? Choosing holiness. It's not going to be the popular thing. It's not going to be the best thing that you feel like sometimes it may not grant you the most money, may not grant you the most friends or whatever. But the safest place you can be is in the middle of God's will, and that is living a holy life. So, as we conclude, where is God when you want to come home? He's waiting for you. And so when I walk in my office every morning, by the way, this is personalized. Anybody notice the difference? The beard. The beard. However, this beard has a full mustache. I can't grow a full mas mustache, so hopefully I'll be... I'm not like Trent Thomas. I mean, I can't grow a full mustache at the age of 15. How old are you now? I'm just kidding. That was a joke. Um, so where is God when I want to come home? He's waiting for you. So in Luke chapter 15, there's a cool little verse in there. You may have caught on to it before, but when I read it for the first time, it was kind of a game changer. So we've already read this, but the prodigal son, he's, he's in the really the pen with pigs eating food. And he comes to himself and he says, you know what, I'm going to go home not to be one of my father's sons, but to be a servant. And what's cool is the prodigal son went back to his father to be a servant instead of the son. And what does his dad make him? A son. And so it's just a beautiful picture of God's relationship with us. When we fail him and we feel like we can't do anything right, what does he still choose to see us as when we come home? A son, a child. So, verse 20, and he arose and he came to his father, but what does the text say? But while he was still what? A long way off. So, in a physical sense, every mile that the prodigal son went away from the father, what did he have to do when he came to himself and decided he wanted to go home? Turn right back around and trek that entire journey. And here's the beautiful part for us tonight, and this, this, this fact never changes. It doesn't matter if you're in sixth grade or, as Philip says, sixth sits grade. It doesn't matter. You can be in sixth grade or you can be 82 years old. When we decide to come home to the Father, unlike the prodigal son, we don't have a long journey because Jesus took the long journey for us. God's will for your life is what? Holiness. Will there be sin in the pursuit of holiness? Yeah. And that's okay because the blood of Jesus is there to forgive us. Where is God when you want to come home today? Where is he when you want to come home 15 years from now? He's in the same place. That's the beauty of the gospel. Uh, Dan Winkler once said, the gospel is incredibly simple, but simply incredible. And that's never changed and never will change. This is a special place, special people, special things. Um, and I know that y'all will do special things when you leave this special place. Let's pray. God, thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight, uh, to come home. Uh, we're thankful for the church, for the bond that we share in you. And Lord, I pray that as we leave here tonight and go our separate ways, 
Um, we go to different homes. We go to different friend groups. We go to different things at school. We just find ourselves in different places and in really every aspect of our life. Lord, I pray that each and every one of us in here will choose to do your will, no matter what situation we find ourselves in, and that is holiness. Lord, we know holiness is not always easy. Oh, we pray that you give us the strength and the courage and courage to stand up for what is right and to live a holy life even when no one else is. We're thankful that you don't expect us to be perfect. We're thankful that Jesus was perfect so that we don't have to, we don't have to be. And Lord, I pray that we will be thankful for that and realize that every single day of our life. Lord, be with us. Uh, help us to be your hands and to be your feet everywhere we go. Um, no matter who we're around or wherever we find ourselves, Lord, help us to live a holy life. And we're thankful for the example of Jesus and for the forgiveness that we have through him. And it's in his name that I pray. Amen. Thank you all again for the opportunity to be here tonight. Go do good, be good, and live holy. Hey guys, one thing before you leave. Uh, appreciate your words, great message. Um, tonight before we dismiss, I just want to uh, to say a special prayer for uh, Rachel and her family. Uh, so if you will, uh, let's uh, bow to God. Dear God, uh, we thank you for this day. Uh, we thank you for all the blessings uh, of this life and of this day that it brings. Thank you for Austin uh, and the great guy he is and uh, the work that he's doing for you. Thank you for the awesome message. And thank you for letting us know that you're waiting for us all the time. And that it's really just about striving to be holy more than our sin, the strive will always be greater than our sin. God, I pray that uh, you be with the Tucker family and with Rachel. Uh, I pray that as they go through this loss in their family right now, that um, you comfort them and you be by their side. God, we are so grateful for Rachel uh, and the excellent servant of God that she is um, and all the good that she had, uh, has done in this youth group throughout the summer and that she will continue to do. I pray that you bless her and uh, that you comfort her. Um, God, we're grateful be your children and we're grateful for your son and the sacrifice he made for us and, uh, and it's in his name that